Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Home for Christmas. I said, Pastor Marcus, what are we going to talk about at Christmas? And he said this, I want you to talk about what Jesus looked like in your family growing up. Now, I had an exceptional father. My father is probably the man who's most like Jesus that I know, period. And I recognize every day that I'm standing on the shoulders of a giant. Um, and just, I wouldn't be where I am today apart from the input that my father gave me. And, you know, and it's, it's just, people, are, people often say this, and I'm not saying this to brag, but they're like, how did you get so much knowledge? I'm like, I literally grew up with Jesus, basically, my dad. So I'm blessed with that. Um, but as a kid, believe it or not, I was kind of a punk. I was. And the most memorable Christmas experience I ever have, and I've told this story before, so some of you are like, just indulge me here, you've already heard the story, but I'm going to make a different point today than I made before, okay? I remember it was our last year, we were growing up as missionaries in Guatemala, Central America, where Pastor Natalie's going to be taking the team next week, so I have a place in my heart for Guatemala. It was our last year in Guatemala, I was about to graduate high school, and my dad announced that like every Christmas, we were going to go help poor kids and give them gifts on Christmas. Now, I was super sentimental because I'm like, I don't want to leave Guatemala, but we have to leave Guatemala. And I was like, Dad, it's our last Christmas in Guatemala. Can't we just do a thing just with our family? He's like, no, no, we're going to go and help the poor kids. And I was like, I'm sick of helping poor kids. (laughs) Don't judge me. And I'll never forget this because dad, my dad, he's got this face that when he turns on this face, Jesus probably had a face too, right? Dad had a face that like most of the time dad's like really cool. But when dad turned on this face, it was coming. And he looked at me and he kind of gently put his hands on both shoulders and he said, Joel, and he quoted a verse from Proverbs. He said, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord and the Lord will repay it. I want the Lord to, I want to be one that the Lord repays. And I was like, okay, I'm a horrible person. And that Christmas, that last Christmas that I was in Guatemala, we did what we did every Christmas, tended to do every Christmas, is we went out and helped poor people. And it was memorable. It was very memorable. In fact, that last Christmas was probably the most memorable one ever. But, you know, Christmas is such an interesting time because it brings a lot of things to the surface that are maybe we can kind of keep under the surface most of the year. And as I was thinking about it, I think one of the things it brings most to the surface is something that we talk, they talk about in economics. It's this idea of scarcity. Scarcity is the idea that there's a deficiency in quantity or number compared with the demand. Or there's not plentiful or abundant amounts of it. And, and I mean, if you live in the world long enough, you know that there's just some people get stuff and other people don't get stuff. And you can complain and yell about it. But there's this idea in economics that scarcity is what drives the world. Lack of things, lack of resources is what drives the world. And I think the way that plays out at Christmas is, for some of us, you're freaking out at Christmas because you're like, man, this is my last Christmas with the kids at home. And they're trying to plan all these events. And I just want it to be just us. Or maybe the kids have just left the house and you're trying to recuperate what you used to have when the kids were still in the house. But now they've got their daughter, they're, 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 uh, they marry, they're married and your daughter-in-law is just not having it. She's like, no, we're going to my family's Christmas. And you're like, dad, I knew there was something wrong with that girl from the beginning, right? <laughs> and it builds, like, there's this thing like, well, I've only got so much time and I want it to be back to the way it used to be, right? Like, kind of like me, I want, you get sentimental about it. And for some of us, man, you're just looking at the price of stuff right now and you're going, this Christmas is going to be hard. Everything's just way more expensive than it used to be. And my money's not going as far as it used to go. And we have this financial lack. Some of you are saying, man, the family's all coming in, but my employer's not giving me time off of work. I used to have that all the time. Like, man, my whole family's going to be in my job. I literally cannot get off of work. And so like I had a small window at Christmas where I could spend with a family and I'm just, I'm, I get kind of resentful of my job because I'm like, oh, you know, there's just this lack of time, there's lack of money. And I think we all kind of acutely feel it at Christmas because for a lot of us, we've got kind of an idea in our mind of what the perfect Christmas looks like, you know, it's back, the kids back at the house like they used to be, but now you hardly ever see the kids anymore. 
Or it's, you know, we used to give so many gifts. All the kids used to get 10 gifts, but now, like, if we're going to be lucky if they get one, especially because gifts now cost, iPads are expensive. <laughs> You're like, yeah, you can get one gift at a $500 price tag, right? So it, there's this scarcity. But what's wild is as you read through the Bible, God does not seem in any way phased by scarcity, by the lack in the world. He just doesn't seem phased by it. In fact, sometimes when I look at how God uses, allows people to use money, I'm like, God, that was really wasteful that you let them do that. But he doesn't seem too worried about it. Sometimes I'm like, God, I've got a way to save you some money. <laughs> you ever done that? You're trying to be a good steward, and you're like, God, I've got a way to save you some money. And he's like, I don't, I don't really care. I mean, I think that's what he's saying, because he like, doesn't let me save him money. We have this, this idea that, we lack, but the thing is, God doesn't lack. In fact, if you think about it, you know, in Hebrews, it says, by faith, we see that what was created was made from nothing. When you have the ability to take nothing and make it something, that's pretty much ultimate power. <laughs> like, you can take nothing, and you can go, let there be something, and it is, just by the word you're spoken. So God, he kind of makes it clear throughout the Bible, there's this one verse I love in Psalms where he says this, he says, I have no need of bull from your stall. He's like, I don't need your bull or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. Bill pointed out earlier, he even owns the hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and all that is in it. He was saying, you guys like you're sacrificing and stuff and you're making these sacrifices, but I, you know, I don't, those sacrifices are for your sake, not for mine. I don't need your stuff. I got it all. And I have to remind myself of that sometimes because one of the core values I, when, when they gave me my daughter, you know, if you, you know, when their first kid comes along and you have the baby, it's the weirdest moment when they put the kid in the, in the uh, car seat, buckle him up and then say, okay, you're free to go. And you're like, is anybody going to supervise us? Or like, I just take this thing home and like, I'm in charge of this thing. Like, it was a scary feeling. And, but I remember when we got home, I started getting really serious. I said, you know, what is it that I want to show are the core thing? Like, what is, what do I want to show our daughter that our family is about? A core value statement. And I came up with four things. One of them is wisdom, which is just rightly applying God's word to your life so you can avoid unnecessary suffering. Another one is humility, which clearly I'm good at. Um, it's kidding. Humility is just having a right, a right perspective on who you are. It's not, you know, looking down on yourself or belittling yourself. It's just saying, here's what I am and here's what I'm not by the grace of God. And then the third one is courage. You know, I've, you guys have talked, I've talked to you guys for years about how much I've struggled with anxiety and fear. And just, I've just learned you just got to do it afraid. Like fear ain't going to go away. The only way to beat fear is to just take it in small doses. And the fourth one is this, what I call open-handed living. Living with open hands. And that's what I want to talk about today, specifically the idea that because of God's incredible abundance that he has for us, we as Christians can live with open hands in a world that's actually quite closed-handed. And I think open-handedness has two elements. The first one is surrender, and the second one is generosity. So I want to talk about these two elements, because I think you have to have both of these, because open-handed living isn't just being, here, let me give you this. It's also saying, God, all this stuff you've put in my hands is available to anyone, and you can even take it back if you need to. Right. I'm not going to hold it too tight. I love some Corrie Tim Boom. She was a survival of the Holocaust. She said this. She wasn't a Jew, but she protected Jews and got sent to a concentration camp. She said, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when God pries your fingers open. And how many of you had an experience of that, that something so valuable to you, it was just, it just felt like God just ripped it out of your hands. And maybe you're hurting a little bit. Maybe you're feeling a little disappointed at God. Maybe you're just plain angry with God. And you're like, I just, that wasn't fair that he took that from me. The one thing I had and he took it from me. But part of what open-handed living means is this, God, everything you have, everything out there that I think I own is actually yours. Yeah. You own those cattle. You own the land. You own the house. You own that car. It really is yours. I couldn't have gotten it apart from you. So here it is. It's in my hands. And if you need to take it out, go for it. If you need to take it out and give it to another person who will be more blessed by it, 
go for it. I'm going to stand here with my open hands. And I think one of the things we have to be really careful of is we get, it's hard to not get sentimental in this world. Life is changing so much. Things are always changing. And sometimes you get attached to something. You're like, I really like this. You really like that season when your kids were at home all the time at Christmas. And now you're like, am I going to get to see them at all this Christmas? And we have to be really careful of sentimentality. King Solomon, he said this. He said, don't say, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise to ask such questions. Man, as you look around the world, I know some of us are going, man, this ain't the world I grew up in. I just wish my kids could grow up in the world like I grew up in. But there's this thing in psychology called rosy retrospection where you tend to look back and remember only the good stuff. So you forget there was some bad stuff with it too, right? And God gives every generation the grace they need to be the light in the generation they're in. And it's so easy to go, man, why can't it be like it used to be? And when you do that, first of all, King Solomon says it's not wise. And what I talk about wisdom is one of my primary um, focuses because wisdom, when you use wisdom, it helps stop unnecessary suffering. There's some suffering in life that's just part of what God uses to transform us into who he wants us to be. And then there's some stuff we create by just holding on to stuff too tightly. Sometimes a season has come and gone. And it's okay to long for the days of yore. It's okay. But if it's causing you to be resentful and not enjoy the present, what God's given you, it needs to go. You need to say, God, here's what I'd like, but... I'm going to trust that what you give me is what I really need. Because God's plan for your life is what you would want your plan to be if you really knew all the details. And sometimes you just have to go, God, this is just not what it was supposed to look like. But here, I'll take what you, what you give me right now. And when you're grateful and content and you surrender to his plan, you have to give up the life that you wanted maybe for the life that he had planned for you. And you'll find that on the end of it, you'll go, wow, that was really what I needed. And this has been a battle for me all the time because, you know, I had some lofty dreams for myself in my 20s. And one of the things that created the greatest amount of frustration for me, I realized that leading up to when I was about to turn 40, was I looked back and I had set some goals for myself in my 20s that were not realistic based on what I wanted for my life. I wasn't married back then. I didn't have kids back then. I was stupid back then. Like... <laughs> And all these new things showed up. Like my wife became a thing of great value to me and my daughter. And all of these dreams I had for myself, I kept holding on to my dreams and then just adding these things of value into it and saying, I can get it all. And realizing, actually, I need to prioritize what's most important. And when I finally let go and said, okay, God, I was supposed to have this done by the time I was 40, but obviously you had other plans and you've given me something even better, really, when I open up my eyes and see it. Man, it was a place of total freedom. And now it's kind of like, well, if God gives me what I had sought, that's cool. If he doesn't, I'm going to trust that what he puts in my hands or takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to learn to surrender. I think that's part of open-handedness, right? The second part is this. I think it's generosity. Now, generosity is straight up a command, okay? It's in the Old Testament. There's rules all about generosity. It says, if among you one of your brothers should become poor... In any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against the poor, your poor brother, even if they could get a job. <laughs> but you shall, I added that, but it's implied. <laughs> but you shall, and I'm going to explain why I implied that in a second. You're like, don't be adding stuff to the Bible. It, later on, it explains it, okay? But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. That was the law. And when Jesus came, he added even more challenge to what was required of us. He didn't come to do away with the law. It says he came to fulfill the law. So he says, guys, here, here's what Jesus said. He says, judge not and it won't be ju- you won't be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will it be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back. The cool thing Jesus is saying is you get to decide how generous people are with you. You're the control valve. If you're open-handed and giving and giving and giving, you can count on it that God's going to say, hey, that's somebody that I can trust to give to because it's never going to stay with him. It's always going to go out. And you become a resource for being life-giving to everyone around you because he's like, I can trust that when it goes here, he's not going to shut off the the pipe, right? He's going to go, all right, that must have been given to me to give out to others. And he says, you get to, you get to decide. 
And, and this is what's really tricky about this world because we live in this world where scarcity drives everything. But God says, no, the key to literally solving all of the problems in the world is actually open-handedness. Let me become the provider. So a couple weeks ago, I went to London to be part of this conference. It's called the ARC Conference, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship. It was a bunch of global leaders, and nobody's like me, who got together, and they basically laid out, they said, look, here's the challenges we face in the West. We've got poverty, we've got infant mortality. A lot of these things are improving, but they're like, how can we solve these issues? They said environmental issues, we, um, you know, where, whatever your take is on the environment, it is changing. I think it's cyclical, but whatever your take is on it, but we do need to care for the environment. And what was fascinating to me is basically all the stuff they laid out that we need to do to restore society is all the stuff God laid out right in Genesis. Amen. Get married, have kids, get a job, you know, all those things. Take responsibility. But one of the things that was so fascinating to me, and this, was, this really stood out to me, was they said, one of the biggest mistakes we're making in the world right now today is we have literally shown that if you want the environment to improve, what you have to do is cause people to want to care about the environment. But the only way to get people to care about the environment is to have their basic needs met to the point where they don't have... So basically, like, you think about in, in poverty, you don't have access to... Anyways, hold on one second. They said basically the best way to do it is to give energy as cheaply and abundantly as possible so that the poor don't have to go down and cut down a forest to make it through the summer, through the winter in the cold. So the way to save de from deforestation is to make energy as cheap and abundant as possible. We have done the opposite recently. We didn't have, and, and here's the thing about God, God's order. It's all higher order thinking. He says, you're thinking this level, but I'm saying if you'll do this, the outcome of it will be way better out here. So we're thinking scarcity in this world, where we're going to run out of the resources, we're going to this or that, or, and what's consequently, it's really easy for us in the West who are wealthy and stuff to go, well, we can pay a little more for gas, but we don't realize what's happening to people in the third world or developing world when they're having to pay that for gas, they're actually going destitute. Right. So they said the best way to raise people out of poverty is to give them energy as cheaply and abundantly as possible. They landed on nuclear, and people are like, nuclear, nuclear. It's actually the, most, the best source of energy, bang for your buck, and it's actually quite clean when you don't put it in tsunami zones. So, <laughs> but what I thought was fascinating about it is they said it's, it's abundantly giving to others what we're trying to hold back on that actually causes them to rise up and then go, oh, all my basic needs are cared for. I don't have to go down and chop down wood. I've got a gas stove. I actually, they actually start to naturally clean up the environment around them and care about the environment. Now, that's higher order thinking, and our politicians aren't higher order. They just think, well, whatever. But if, it's crazy that God already laid all this stuff out. And he says, guys, open-handedness and abundance and giving to the poor. And when I say giving to the poor, this is what's really dangerous about this. Giving to the poor doesn't mean let me give you a handout. It means let me walk with you as you raise yourself up out of the poverty. And this is what's really dangerous about compassion. A lot of people get their kicks and giggles from being the person that bails someone out. Compassion can come really diabolical really fast. And, and, and it's easy to just throw money at something and not actually walk along with somebody. But true compassion walks along somebody and empowers them to rise up. It gives them dignity as you're giving to them. And again, this is why I think the church does the best job of compassion work, not the government. The church is like, hey, we're going to give you dignity when you do this. But one of the, like, we're going to give you the resources to help yourself and to rise yourself out. Because, I mean, how many of you know that, like, it feels good to work and having accomplished something with your own hands? But when you just hand somebody something, like they may be grateful for it, but what you're doing is you're actually creating them, you get to be the little God who saves them. And it can become diabolical in a hurry. It can start as compassion, but it can really quickly turn to, let me be here to save you and bail you out because I'm such a good person. Particularly when you see that guilt is being leveraged against people right now. In fact, you know what's fascinating? I was listening, to, there's this guy named Aaron Beck and he came up with something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm going somewhere with this. You're like, what is he talking about? Hold on. Cognitive behavioral therapy. He says, 
the, the, the prevailing mindset or storyline of people that have depression, and cognitive behavioral therapy has been the number one, shown to be the number one way to treat depression, okay? But the number one storyline of people with depression is this. I'm a bad person, the world is a bad place, and the future is bleak, which basically sounds like what most people are saying today yeah. in our culture. And I think we have a culture in depression. And so what happens is they're very prone to being to guilt being used against them. You're a bad person. Look what the West has done to these countries over here. Look what you've done. All these people are poor because of you. And so you get the kicks and giggles from giving. You're not empowering them to help themselves. You're just getting the kicks and giggles from being the guy that has the money and can just throw money at it. And that's the power oftentimes of going to these places. You go, well, why don't we just send money on mission trips? This, I'm giving you my whole philosophy on life here this morning. Well, why don't you just send the money? It's a lot cheaper than sending people on mission trips. Yeah, but there's something that happens when you send people to go and help them empower others to do it. It sounds compassionate to just throw money at something, which unfortunately that's what the government thinks will do it, but it's not true. What, what, when you give people the dignity of helping them raise themselves up and build their own ability to provide for themselves like God calls us to do and take responsibility for yourself, that's truly giving to the poor. And that's hard, which is why most people don't do it. Most people just love the fun they get from feeling like they were so generous. Just here, let me throw this stuff at you. And you go, no, no, you have to empower people and give them dignity as you're doing it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think this is all wrapped up in open-handedness. And here's why. Let me explain this. Some of you are like, what the heck? Was that like a politics lesson? No. It's how God's truth applies into the world today. And the messes we're in are because we're not applying God's truth. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Now, this verse is incredibly powerful because here, here's the thing we are called to give period when you see a need it says in the old testament you're called to give but what can happen is first the really hard part is he doesn't say the minimum standards for how much to give in the old testament he said give your tithe but then jesus came and he said that's just the baseline you need to be given like your whole life needs to be giving you go, well, how much should I give? I just need to know, like, give me a box to check off so I know I've given enough. And God, Jesus like, you don't get off that easy. Because truly giving is tricky. And he says, you've got to give what you've decided in your heart to give, not out of guilt because, oh, you're from the West who's oppressed others or whatever. You've got to give because there's something deeper driving you than guilt. You've got to give because God's spirit inside of you is driving you to give. And you've got to be listening to him saying, I know I'm called to give. How much am I called to give? Because I know this happens a lot. People get resentful of that one family member that always takes advantage of your generosity. I had somebody come to me the other day. It's like, how do we know when to cut somebody off in our family? And I brought them to this verse because this verse is powerful because here's what he says. You have to give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Compulsion means feeling like you're being forced to. You ever felt like you're being forced to give? Yeah. Taxes? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Each one of you must, so he's saying, you don't get off from not giving. I'm sorry you don't, but here's where you start. How much can you give without feeling resentful about it? And this will save your marriage right here, folks. Sometimes you're like, I just, man, she left dishes in the sink again. I'm sick of cleaning these dishes. Part of your job? This never happens in my house, just for the record. Don't even start. <laughs> All right. The dishes are in the sink. Whoever left them there. And you're like, ah, oh, they're in there again. You know, I'm not going to clean all those dishes. But what I started doing is I was like, all right, I want to give because I love my wife. Just, just say that possibly maybe she left the dishes accidentally. <laughs> so I say, I want to give because I love my wife. But I don't want to wash all those dishes. So I ask myself, how much can I give right now without becoming resentful? I'm like, you know what? I can clean that pot and a couple of those plates. I clean them, put them away, and then I walk away. And you know what's crazy? Once I get myself together, 
get changed after work or whatever. Maybe I'll come back and be like, yeah, I can do a couple more. And you do a couple more. But I'm not doing it resentfully like, dang it, my wife. <laughs> and, and you're following what Paul says. He's like, you're giving because that's what you're required to do. But you're doing it at the level that you can do it without being resentful, and you're doing it from a place that you have the right heart about it. And here's the really cool part about it. If you take that little step of faith, here's what it says. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He's saying, if you'll just do the little bit that you can give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, I'll give you the grace to give even more. But it starts with your first little step. And this comes to everything in life whether it's giving time to others, whether it's giving energy, the question you've got to ask is, first of all, the question isn't, should I give? Because we're called to give. If somebody asks you, the question is, how much can I give without feeling compulsion? Like I'm being forced to or guilted into it. Because guilt is a thing we're so much in our world today. You're a horrible person because of your skin color. Or you're a horrible person because you grew up on this side of the tracks. No, 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 no. That's like, you know what that's called? That's called judgment and racism. Like, wrong. That's a wrong thing. Don't let anybody throw guilt on you that makes you out of compulsion give. You've got to decide, I'm applying a higher standard to my life. And it may look like, God may call me to give way more than I think I'm capable of giving. But how much can you give without feeling compulsion, being forced to, feeling guilt? And the goal isn't to give as little as you can, because then you don't, that's not open-handedness. The goal is to say, here's what I can give right now, and I know that as I give, God's going to give me even more desire and more grace and more power to give even more. And that's where Jesus, what he said, comes into play, where he says, give and it'll be given to you even more abundantly. You get to decide how much blessing is poured into your life by your level of generosity. So my prayer for you guys this this year is that you would live this Christmas open-handed. And for some of you, that may look like saying, you know what? If it's just me alone on Christmas and the kids don't come home, my husband has to work, we're going to try what we can, everything we can to do. But if it doesn't work out, I'm going to trust that God's got a plan right in the middle of that and I'm going to look for what he's got for me. Some of you are looking around and you're going, there's just no way we can afford what we've got. What we're trying to pull off, there's no way we can afford it this year. So you know what? We're just going to be honest about it. We're not going to go into debt. We're just going to say, you know what? God, we're going to trust. You're going to provide for all of our needs, and we're going to take what we can give right now. And some of you are going, I don't think we even have any money to afford to give this year. Well, I do have that little bit I was setting aside for the motorcycle. But, and maybe God's saying to you, hey, give that up give that up. And then don't be surprised if later down the road, he gives you a blessing that's even greater than what you thought was going to be the blessing. You don't do it for that reason. You do it because we're called to give. It's a command as a Christian. But I pray, man, as we as we live open-handed this year, not trying to hold on to what used to be or what, what we thought should have been, or not trying to hold on to, you know, how much money we think we should spend to make a good Christmas. We just say, God, right now this year, I'm going to relax. I'm going to chill out. You don't need my bull, so I ain't going to give you no bull. I'm just going to trust that what you give me this year is going to be enough. And that what I'm going to do this year, what's going to come this year, I'm going to trust that your grace is sufficient in every situation. You're right there with me. And that's what I think I learned from Christmas. With my dad growing up, my mom, is open-handedness. And that's my prayer for you guys. That, man, that, that tendency we all have to think of that in the worldly way of scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough to realize... My dad owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns them hills and he owns everything. And in one touch of his favor, he can give me everything that I need. So I'm just going to relax and enjoy celebrating his birth that he came to earth this year. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you are our provider. And we thank you, Lord, that when we live with open hands, it's really an act of faith. It's us showing of stewardship of us showing, Lord, you can provide for all of our needs as we just become a conduit that you give through and then we use that to help others. So I pray that we would just continue to walk in that. If you're here this morning, you have not given your life to Jesus. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a chance in just a second to say a prayer. And when you say this prayer, if you mean it with all your heart, God is going to come and he's going to forgive all your sins. He's going to wipe away your past. He's going to set you up with an eternal address with him there in eternity. So let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way, we turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen.
Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you in the back. Also, this is the last week to sign up for our Sustainable Discipleship Program. This is like next level. If you want to take your walk with God to the next level, it is not for the weak of heart. But if you're one of those that say, man, I really want to know what's in the Bible. I really want to get engaged with this. This is the program for you. Sign up is also back there at the back booth. You guys stand. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.